Let's make sure you're on. Hello. Ah, How's good. Working? Okay. Uh, is to, to turn it right over to Rabbi with uh, some questions for your reflection and comment, because I know even though there'll be spontaneous responses, they've always come with a great deal of reflective thought about them. Don't give me that hard time. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. first question He knows me too well. Yeah. Yeah. What do you perceive as uh, the advantages of aging, the value added of aging? I must tell you, I'd never thought about it. And the actual uh, title of this morning, I just heard for the first time. Or if I heard it before, I forgot it. And I probably forgot it because I wanted to forget it. <laughs> but whatever it is, aging is simply a process to which you have to get used. and. You can, of course, basically say to yourself, I don't want to go old, get old, but I would like to stay young or younger. And you very quickly understand that this is impossible, that you are in the, in the hands of a power and of a process that exceeds your capacity to control it. In other words, Aging is something that happens to you whether you like it or not. And then the question is, how can you like it? Is there a possibility of liking it? And that's very difficult. I've often asked myself, why am I 99 and a half years old now? Almost every day, for one reason or another, I have to think of the fact that I'm 99 and a half years old. And I say to myself, how come? And there's no answer for me that I can find that makes any kind of sense. It seems I, I've been around long enough in life now, and especially as a rabbi of this wonderful community in which I had been the privilege to be able to work and, and live, to have seen many people who passed out of life at a very young age, 60, 70, 80. To me, these are now youthful ages. And that is, of course, one of the things that, you, that I then have to face and with which I have to somehow come to a conclusion. What is it that is added to me or that happens to me in such a way that I should be grateful? And I must tell you, it's difficult. Every day is of drama. Every day to get out of bed, to get dressed, to eat, to do whatever is necessary to be done as a living creature gets more and more difficult. And therefore the question as to what is the value of getting older is very hard to find any kind of positive and convincing answer. So what happens is that I simply assert accepted the notion that I'll simply yield to the fact that I'm getting older, that there's one day when I won't be here. I don't know which one that will be, where it will be, how it will come, but I know it, it has to come. And I'm not uh, trying to delay it by any kind of exercise or artificial kind of means, I know that this is not effective. This is a process that has taken a hold of me. And as never before, I have found that I am a creature. And a creature means that you are not self-fulfilling, 
self-sufficient. To be a creature means that something else has the power over you. And so I finally have to come to the conclusion I simply got to sit back and allow it to happen. I shouldn't in any way try to delay it artificially or by any kind of uh, artifice. I don't have one. There isn't any. Someday, I mean, my darling wife is a hundred now, and in two months she'll be a hundred and one. I think she's sitting there back there somewhere, and she'll hear me. And she has no more control over the fact that she's this old, and she often uh, therefore has a feeling that it, it is too much. It should already have stopped. And there are days when she really hopes that the time of departure is near. It is a difficult thing for me to hear. I don't want her to leave me. This is very selfish, but for the last 74 years, that has been the indispensable part of my being. And I can't imagine what it will be like to be without her. So I understand a little bit from her life and her feelings and her attitudes towards herself, how aging is first of all not at all in our own hands, is a process that has taken over and is working in us in a way that we have nothing to, to tell about. We are simply the objects, to, I will even talk more, the victims of a process that is far beyond us. And that leads me, of course, then to a much different kind of an understanding. I've asked myself, what is it that it'll be that when I will be dead. Because that is, of course, what's going to happen. I've been in a, in a room with people who were dying and who transit, transit from a moment of a life to a moment of death. I've had to be there because <clears throat> that was part of what I had to do. I had been asked by the family to come and help their dear one make the transition, as it were, from life to death. So I know a little something about, what should I call it, the effects, but nothing really about the process. And so I began to ask myself, what is life? What is death? And these are questions <clears throat> that seemingly seem easy to identify and to talk about. But quite to the contrary, I have found that they are exceedingly subtle and difficult to deal with. I have found that I began to think more what should I say, more personally, more intently, about how I got to be born. And I know that some sperm found an ovum. Totally, as far as I know, uncontrolled, unintended, accidental. So I came to the conclusion that everybody who is alive is the result of an accidental event where one of a million of sperms finds one of a few hundred uh, eggs hidden in the darkness of a wife's womb 
And it is there that in this meeting, an extraordinary event occurs. All of a sudden, the, the uh, original cell divides. And that division continues in such a way that within, for instance, two or three weeks after this process has begun, you can already tell which of the pieces that have developed will be a brain or a, a toe or an ear. And what really happens, if you look at it this way, is there isn't, it's totally miraculous. This is ultimately absolutely beyond anyone's control. The birth of a person is a miracle of such enormous quality and, and depth that there is nothing comparable to it anywhere. So, if this is how I got to be, that my late father, who was in the trenches at Verdun in the First World War, had gotten a furlough, and as a result of that furlough and his visit with my mother, somehow this extraordinary, unusual process began. He had no control over it. The only control that I ever had over my father's life was that I was late for my bris. So the, the fellow that he had arranged to be to come back to Munich from the front uh, to be present at my bris had to be delayed. And he got an, uh, a permit from his captain who, because he was at that time, he was a sergeant, wounded sergeant, a decorated sergeant in the uh, German army. <clears throat> he got a per permit to go a, a week later, which was all the delay that, I need, that he needed to be present at my purse. And so he was walking back from the front towards a place where he could get transportation back to Munich. And as he was walking back there, he was overtaken by the messenger of the, of the company who was fought, totally splattered with mud. And so he, he stopped him and said, What's, what happened to you? He said, Adolf, you don't know how lucky you are. And the moment you left the under, the, uh, the cage <laughs> in, the, in, the, in, in, in the trenches, which was yours and over which you had uh, a, well, control with your, with your depart, detachment, had a full uh, hit and everybody was dead. So my father has always thought that I was his lifesaver because I was late. I mean, this just indicates the absolute uncontrollable process by which life unfolds. So the very fact that my press was delayed, that I didn't come at the, on time, which was the first and only time that I was never on time. <laughs> <laughs> because just happened, just happened. How did it happen? I have no idea why it was, why I, I didn't come. Uh, for, wasn't ready for the press when it was supposed to be. I, I just have no idea. Nobody ever fi figured it out. My father, who was a mathematician and physicist afterwards, uh, had no intention to try to figure out why I was late because he did no longer want to go into any details. He was glad I was there and that was it. And he was very happy. He was not in the, with his troop in, at that moment when they had a, a full hit. So, thinking therefore about life, I began to understand how totally accidental the whole process of being born and becoming present in this world 
has to be understood. And that is an enormous uh, discovery. I never thought of it. I always thought that producing life was a process in which people decided to do something and their decision is what was the important thing. Not so. Even when we have the Im imagination or the illusion that we had something to do that was our plan to become pregnant is really just that, an illusion. And so I began thinking, if my, if my birth was an entirely proce a process totally independent of any will that I might have had, or any uh, control that anybody would have had, I then began to think about death. Is death anything different? And here we come to a very interesting conclusion. There are some circumstances under which death becomes planable. Either because someone has come to the conclusion that this life which was given to him or her totally without any kind of control, was worthless. And that he, he or she had the right to end it. Or, and this is even worse, that we give the control over this to an institution such as the state, or the judicial process, or even worse, to no really planable act where by accident one can kill something, can kill a person, which happens much too frequently simply because we are not aware of the, of the utterly precious singularity of life. Life is something so unplanable, so uncontrollable, that the miraculous condition of being alive is simply something that is overwhelming once we come to an understanding of how it happens. And the same thing is really true, basically, of death. Death, too, occurs when let me just put it in a, a curious fashion. When death wants to do it. Because there are many people who get sick and die from their illness that had no intention to leave the, the world, to be dead. Because it is, of course, quite clear that whatever we understand to be life, once we accept its miraculous origin, is something that we are test, tempted to manage, to control to an extent. We, make, we try to make life comfortable, livable. We try to make life uh, enjoyable life as a producer of important things such as thought, such as the ability to create beauty, such as the ability to think. So, what this whole question that you've asked me has produced in me is a whole complex of basic notions. There just is ultimately 
none of this uh, illusion that we have that we're in control, that we are the ones who will determine life and death. And to the extent that we have allowed our, shall we say, institutional life to take over the notion of how it produce, how it will control life, or how it can control life, is really a total ignorance and rejection of the miracle of existence. So my friends, what am I saying to you? Do I know when I'm going to die? No. Am I prepared? I, well, in this sense that I know it's inevitable. I mean, after all, by all the, the conclusions that we can draw and do draw, I've long lived beyond my measure. So how, how long do I want to be here? I don't know. And I also don't want to do anything to uh, promote and speed up whatever the time sense of my end will be. So in a way, this sounds a little funny, doesn't it? I'm really saying I have no control and all I can do is to sit back and do the best I can while I'm here to do the least damage to myself or to the world in which I live. If I have the capacity and the opportunity, such as you give me, for instance, here this morning, to address a group of people and to tell them some of my innermost thoughts, this is a gift of priceless quality. And I'm aware of it. When I come to my study group on Saturday morning, there's always an unspoken prayer in me. How fortunate I am that there's a group of people who want to study with me and who therefore I make my life effective and significant to me for at least those few hours and my preparation for it I always start preparing already on Monday. And when Monday comes, I have to start li listening to the Torah portion so that I have a chance over the next few days to let it grow in me and, and, and challenge me and tell me things I had never thought of before. And that is really the beauty of my Torah study with my group here. And I am so grateful to those few men and women who are willing to come and participate in this process. And I say participate in the process. They are not willless beings to whom some kind of a sage delivers a message. This is not how this group functions anymore, thank goodness. And they have, have become the co-producers of whatever happens there. And that is what is to me most precious and makes my being in the world useful and appropriate. So, I told I've spoken a long time, haven't I? You certainly have. <laughs> okay. But you've also certainly added a layer upon layer of reflection and challenge some of which is very hard to hear. Well, it's very clear to me that even my process of being born and living would not have been possible without so many other people, some known, some unknown to me. I live in a society, and the influence of that society is enormous. I mean, when I look at my life, I, got, I was born in Munich, Germany, 
during the First World War and how I'm happening to come to Chicago and become rabbi of a congregation here. I mean, this is a story of, of so many impossible uh, idea, uh, events and so forth, uh, over which, again, I had no control. I, I was not the one who wanted to, um, uh, uh, but to, con to compete for a, a place on the on the group of people in the, in the seminary in Berlin where I was studying to come to the United States on a scholarship. I had no idea. In fact, I didn't want to go. And I told my father by letter that I wouldn't apply. And my father had a good friend, a retired rabbi, with whom he discussed my life or my, my rabbinic uh, plans. And that retired rabbi made one comment to my father, Herman must gain. Herman has to go. So my father wrote me a letter because in those days you didn't telephone long distances. That was much too expensive and too difficult to do. So I got a letter two, three days later saying, you've got to apply Rabbi Freudenthal asks you to do so. And I was trained to be obedient. I mean, this was part of the German environment. When you were told by somebody in authority what to do, you did it. And so I applied, and by a whole strange process over which, again, I had no control and had no intention to participate in, I was picked among five people to come to the United States. Well, ask yourself, what does all of this mean in terms of life? It is this transfer from Berlin in 1935 that first of all saved my life eventually, I'm sure. Most of the people in the Lehranstalt for the Wissenschaft, the Studentums in Berlin died in Germany, including some of my friends. And the other thing that I had nothing to do with was that I had no knowledge what Reform Judaism was. <laughs> in fact, it was so impossible to think of it that when I came here and started to live there the first day, I had no idea what I was going into. I mean, I, the five of us went to the first meal. We sat at a table by ourselves because nobody would sit with us. We were strange animals. And we looked around. There wasn't a single kippah in the room, not a single one. And when we did what we used to do, say, a a bracha before the meal and after the meal. In, in protest, the student body walked out. This was our, our reception in America. This is, and this was on Thursday. And then we were told on Shabbat we would go to services in the morning and that someone would come and take us. And so we dressed ourselves in our best clothes, which was at that time a blue shirt, a sort of a silk shirt, and our best pants and a hat. And up drove a car with an absolutely flashing uh, blonde on the on the uh, at, 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 uh, on the on the on the wheel, and she got out, and she said, "I'm here to get you." Well, one of our people knew enough English. I did not. I couldn't speak a sentence of English at that point, not one, and said, "Who are you?" And she was the 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 wife 
of the assistant new rabbi who had just come to this uh, major uh, synagogue in Reform Judaism, which had been a historic uh, place in the development of Judaism. And she was coming and she drove a car on Shabbos. I had never been in any conveyance on Shabbos. When we had to go to the synagogue, as we did every Shabbos, we walked and, and we were, there were three brothers and my father, and we walked from the four of us, from Tengstraße to whatever the address of the synagogue was, 25 minutes walk, no matter what the, 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 the weather, we walked there, and then 25 minutes after we, the service was over, back home, I mean, this is all I knew. This is the life I lived and was happy and very content with. And here I come to a, a place where the wife of the rabbi is running. First of all, it's a, flat, a smashing beauty. And the car the, or the wife? The, I don't know the car, but uh, probably the car too, because there was a new car. Because, and she, she had very short skirts. I mean, there was also something I, I'd never been in the neighborhood of. So the five of us piled in this car, and she drove us a few minutes to the synagogue. Synagogue. <laughs> Temple. This was no synagogue, it was a temple. We got out and she marched us from the entrance through the middle lane. Well, the service had already started, we were late. And here the five of us walked in with our hats and we sat in the front row, that's where she put us. And the rabbi had almost a heart attack. <laughs> He had never seen a, a, an, an invasion of his service. He was conducting a service. He was one of the first, he was one of the survivors of the first class of the Hebrew Union College, which was founded in 1875. So he, Rabbi Philipson, was one of the great, uh, what should I say, uh, giants of Reform Judaism. He had a, a reputation of being the, the leader, the, the thinker. He, and he was up there and he watched us and they gave us a prayer book or what they call a prayer book, which was all in English. There was one line in Hebrew, the Shema, that was all. The rest was all in English. We, well, can you imagine what the, what the shock was for someone like me coming into this service. I knew the, the, the Hebrew service of the liturgy by heart by now, because I've been there. I mean, I, I've gone to services with my father for years, and I had said it, I had prayed it every Shabbos morning. I knew it by heart. I didn't need a prayer book. And I looked at this, I mean, I, and then when the services were over, we were introduced to Rabbi Philipson, who told us that if we would ever again come into a synagogue with our hat on, he would stop the service and have us ejected. At least that's how we understood what he said. So this was the first Shabbat after having left Germany. I was by this time 19 years old. I wasn't a baby. And some of our, of the group were 20, 21st years old already. And so they had also a background totally different than this. And so this was our first Shabbat in the, you know, in the, in the new life. Well, let me just tell you an event. I refused to go to services in the Hebrew Union College without a kippah. So, I wore a kippah, and eventually the faculty got used to me wearing a kippah. None of them did. 
And because I had a fairly good voice, I became part of the, the choir and had usually a role as the tenor soloist. So on Shabbos morning especially, I would chant certain portions of the, of the reform liturgy simply because I was able to, to chant nicely. And so I was up in the choir loft and with my kappa. They couldn't and, see it up there, right? <laughs> no, no, it was, it was easy to, to hide it there. And then one Shabbat, I don't know, after about half a year or two being there, I woke up a little late, got quickly dressed and got to the, ran to the synagogue, the chapel, it was not a synagogue, it was a chapel, <laughs> <clears throat> to get up to my place because my, my opening solo was just about there and I, and I had to go. And I reached into my, my pockets and looked for my kippah. No kippah. I was sure that I would not leave that synagogue alive that God would punish me the way I had expected to be punished if I did something so wrong as to go to services without my head uncovered. And here the services unfolded and completed and I went, walked back to my room and I was totally overwhelmed. How come God had not taken any kind of action against me? How come I came out alive? I did something so wrong that I should have been punished severely. And so I began to think about the need of the kippah. And I came to the conclusion that apparently God was willing to accept my prayers if I didn't have a kippah. Now, I was about 20 years old, or maybe beginning 24, I don't, 21. I don't remember when exactly this happened in my life, but I remember the incident as though it happened yesterday because I was completely convinced that I was to be punished. So this is how part of my transition from my upbringing to my eventual acceptance of Reform Judaism began, mm -hmm. because up to that time, I had been a very unwilling student. I had just, well, first of all, I had had not a single day in university. When I came to Berlin, right out of high school, as was normal, and I applied for acceptance as a student at the University of Berlin, they told me I could no longer be accepted because I was a Jew, and so I had no, no, no university experience. I get to the Hebrew Union College, and they demanded that I have a degree from a university. So, one of the senior students took me by the hand and went with me to the University of Cincinnati, and I had with me my final uh, degrees in my studies from high school, and I showed them what I had learned, and I went from department to department, from history to, to uh, English to French to Latin to Greek, and by the time I'd finished going to all that and collected the necessary uh, well, amounts of 
credit. I was a BA. I had 124 credits, and that's what you needed to be a BA in those days in Cincinnati. So this was ridiculous for them. And they decided that I would be a senior student, would have to take English. I had still, I couldn't speak English. This senior student spoke for me. I could not converse with anybody in, in authority. And that I had to take a, a major and a minor. I had no idea what this was. The student said to me, but the major is going to be English. You have to have at least two years of studying in the university in English. And then I said, and what, what minor should I take? And he said, how about German? And so I took German as a minor. I'd been in class in German with a professor who was a graduate of Yale, he told, he told all of us. And after about three weeks, he, he called me in and said, don't you ever come back to my class. I'll, I'll give you credit. And I had corrected him. He had made an obvious mistake between dative and genitive. Oh. And I had, I had had the notion. I'd seen other students talk to the professor. So I raised my hand. And in German, I could talk. And I said, you know, professor, this is wrong. This is not a genitive, this is a dative. <laughs> he didn't want me in class anymore. So I had to have, however, another, uh, another minor. And so we, the, my, my friend from uh, the college said, everybody takes uh, psychology. So we went to the psychology department. They didn't have a chair left. They were full. So he said, so what you should do? He says, well, you go to the end of the hall. There's the philosophy department. They always have chairs. So I went to the philosophy department and enrolled in philosophy, which became one of the, uh, one of the parts of my future life to this day. I, try to read some philosophical texts and so on, because I, I had a wonderful professor who was a, a, a minister in the Episcopal Church, and he had a real understanding for someone who was a religiously oriented person trying to make sense of philosophy. And so, <laughs> you know, I'm telling you much of what happened in my early life here in this country. And it is, to me, sometimes when I think about it, just as beyond understanding and certainly beyond my control again, it's all happened in a way accidentally. And that is a real story for me, that no matter how much I want to control something, it isn't controllable always. Is that a back door in any way to that the journey is worth it to accept that we're not in control and, and not simply say it's all random and meaningless? Where, where's the meaning in the journey? The meaning is that I have to be ready to make this journey under these conditions. I mean, there could be all kinds of journeys. There could be journeys that you control from the moment you buy a ticket and the time till you get home. And then there are other journeys, and the journeys of my life is <clears throat> I have no control. It happens to me. What is expected of me is that I have somehow the willingness to receive what is being offered. And to, in a way, uh, live with it. So I've come to the conclusion that so much of my existence, and there could go on, talk about my marriage and so on. I don't, I don't want to be a bother you with, with all this person stuff, but my whole personal life is similarly a 
a challenge to me to accept what life has dealt me. And it has been shocking at one t a time or another. It, it would have maybe been destructive of me, really, if I hadn't already been in this process of accepting what was de being dealt with to me. And then it, every, I mean, I had the wonderful experience that no matter what I needed to adjust to, it was much better than what I had ever thought of. And this is true of my marriage, for instance, to my beloved wife, Lotte. So, I mean, this, this is how things have happened to me. And you wondered some of these, I, I've, offered, I've done things to here this morning that I never thought I would do it in public. I've told you so much about me and how my life has developed and how things happen to me that I'm a little embarrassed. In a way, maybe the only thing I can tell you is you should be sufficiently confident that you have lived certain values in life that have proved to be good values, steady values, and you would say that if these values are truly values in the sense that they deserve to be, to, to be made permanent, or, or go, then they go even beyond your own life. I mean, if, but what really I think the answer would be is to say, leave a, lead a life, I'm saying this to myself all the time, lead a life that would at least be sufficient to allow people to say, they can judge what you were, how you've existed, how you've been effective in the, the way you, you, you uh, have dealt with your own problems, with your own life. You have to be available, you have to be able to defend your own existence as a, as a sufficient and maybe even a valuable contribution to the sum total of life. I don't know. It, I, I don't have any very clearly thought through answers that I could give you right now. I'm struggling to say to you the only way I can deal with this ultimate question is to be self-reflective and sufficiently judgmental of your own life and to try to improve, even at this point in my life, with things that I should do better and could do better, and to admit the fact that there are things that I could do better even today. And this has something to do with the way I deal with my love, my, my wife, with my employees, with, that I deal with whatever requests are being made of me and my judgment of them and so forth and so on. Well, there's really no other answer but to live. I mean, we could, of course, be rebellious, and some people are, and I don't think that that is a very good answer to anything, because in our rebelliousness, we often do damage. We often forget where, what really the, the values are that we need to treasure. And so the answer is really to be considerate, especially of others, and to take the life and values of other lives as important as your own or more important than your own, and therefore to, to live in a way that uh, continues to be what I would consider from my point of view, a worthwhile existence. And that is, of course, 
not easy, especially under certain circumstances. I know of people who suffer terribly before they die, and I know that. I've been with people like that in my life, in my, my work, and there is very little you can say to them. The only thing that I ever found was of any kind of values, I simply was there for them. I touched them, I sat with them, I maybe sometimes prayed, if that helped.